The following program is brought to you by democracyatwork.info. Broadcasting from a U.S. colony, my name is Andrew Mercado Vasquez, and this is Puerto Rico Forward, a program that takes a look at the economic and legal structures at play between the United States of North America and Puerto Rico. Now, in past episodes, I've attempted to highlight how Puerto Rico's current status as a U.S. colony is the result of over a century of legislation and jurisprudence that time and time again has resulted in the affirmation of Congress's plenary powers over the archipelago. Since I've already discussed the legal origins of Puerto Rico's colonial status, I won't be covering that today. However... For a review, head over to episode two of this program, where I go into detail on how the current political condition came to be. To begin, let's discuss exactly why Puerto Rico's current status is so toxic for its political and economic development. Now, if you take a moment to read up on financial or economic news, more often than not, you'll stumble upon a few articles about some new trade treaty between countries, a new tax increase or decrease proposed by a government, a change in interest rates proposed by a central bank, the legalization or criminalization of a specific activity, and many other similar stories. These stories will usually touch on the fact that it is states who are taking such actions since they alone have the power to do so. And when I use the term state, I don't only mean within the context of a federalized union, but rather at an international level as well. You see, in a world where you buy your clothes from China and your cars from Japan, more than ever states play an important role in shaping the economy through the use of their power to implement economic and legal measures. And to further understand the importance of the state and how it relates to Puerto Rico, let's take a look at their defining characteristics. Now, on the topic of what defines a state, the Greek philosopher Aristotle once wrote, and I quote, Every state is a community of some kind, and every community is established with a view of some good. But if all communities aim at the same good, the state or the political community, which is the highest of all, and which embraces all the rest, aims, and in greater degree than any other, at the highest good. End of quote. Now, if we accept this broad description as true, we find that a state, within the international sense, is a community that may be composed of other communities within it. As such, the state is considered to be the dominant force, and according to professors Kenneth Newton and Jan von Death, in order to maintain its status, a state must be more powerful than any of the communities it incorporates. As a result, power is necessary for the development of the state but is far from sufficient. Territorial limits, people, and the concept of sovereignty are also vital for a state to be recognized. Now let's look at each one of them. The first basic element of a state is that it considers a certain geographic area to be its own. This territory can vary greatly in size and characteristics. However, the limits of said territory must be defined and it must be enduring. The next element of a state is the concept of a people, which can be defined as a group of individuals that share common consciousness and identity. As a result of them having the same things in common, these people form a collective entity. The third and last characteristic that makes up a state, and in my view the most important for the case of Puerto Rico, is sovereignty. Now once again I refer back to the writings of professors Kenneth Newton and Jan Vak Doth. They define sovereignty as, and I quote, the highest power that gives the state freedom of action within its own territory, end of quote. In other words, a state with sovereignty has that independence that allows it to use its power and claim authority. Now, it's important to point out that sovereignty is not synonymous to power. While sovereignty is a form of state authority, power, as defined by Professor Ellen Grinsby, is, and I quote, the ability to influence an event or outcome that allows the agent to achieve an objective or to influence another agent to act in a matter in which the second agent, on its own, would not choose to act. End of quote. Now, although two states might be equals when it comes to sovereignty, one's power can be greater than the other's. 
Now, if we apply the analysis to Puerto Rico, we see that it meets two out of the three defining characteristics of a state. It does have a defined territory and it is, in fact, inhabited by a people. However, the characteristic of sovereignty is absent due to Puerto Rico's colonial status. As we have discussed in the past, from a legal standpoint, Puerto Rico belongs to, but is not a part of, the U.S., as a result, Puerto Rico does not have sovereignty of its own, but rather is under the U.S.'s sovereignty. This, to be more precise, is the reason for which Puerto Rico cannot be considered an independent country. This is why Puerto Rico is under Congress's plenary power. It is, as a matter of fact, without sovereignty of its own. The hindering impact this has on Puerto Rico's ability to develop a coherent long-term economic plan or policy is easily observed. For starters, Puerto Rico is covered by the U.S. Constitution's Commerce Clause. Article 1, Section 8 states that, and I quote, The Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states and with the Indian tribes. End of quote. Now, this clause was inserted into the Constitution's text in reaction to the framers' legitimate concern as to the possibility that some states of the Union could develop legal mechanisms that would act as barriers against capital and goods flowing from other fellow states. If allowed, such measures would hinder national economic development. This clause has provoked a slew of court decisions stemming from the early 18th century to this day that have given way to a slightly different variation of the Constitution's Commerce Clause. It's the Dormant Commerce Clause. Now, this essentially means that states, including Puerto Rico, may not establish protectionary measures that impede the inflow of non-local goods in favor of local ones. The practical effect is that Puerto Rico, for example, cannot enact a law to protect its own beef industry by imposing restrictions on the import of beef. And this is a real-life example, by the way. Now, the matter of sovereignty is actually quite present in the development of Congress's power to regulate commerce. Professor Joffrey R. Stone, while explaining the origins of the U.S. Constitution, highlights the importance of each state's sovereignty in the development of it. And I quote, to understand the Constitution and the surrounding debates on its purposes and effects, it is useful to have some understanding of the Articles of Confederation which the Constitution replaced. The Articles were adopted shortly after the Revolution in order to ensure some unification of the states regarding common foreign and domestic problems, but the overriding understanding was that the states would remain sovereign. End of quote. As we can observe, sovereignty is no small detail. In my opinion, it's the backbone of any attempt by a populace to develop itself into a prosperous state. Professor Stone's recounting of how the U.S. Constitution came to be is a great example of how states use their sovereignty as leverage when faced with a decision that involves their political future. The already mentioned Commerce Clause is a prime example of this type of situation. It wasn't until the then-independent states allowed it that Congress was granted the power to tax and regulate commerce in the Constitution. As we know, Puerto Rico's story is completely different. As I said in the pilot episode of this program, the archipelago sovereignty was ripped away from it back in 1508 by the Spanish Empire and later handed over to the U.S. in 1898. For 510 years now, half a millennia, a little bit more, the people of Puerto Rico have had their sovereignty sequestered by another country. And of course, the issue of sovereignty is not only important to states at an international level, as we've already mentioned, the states of a union, such as the U.S., are also recognized a distinct sovereignty, separate from that of the country they form. Although vast, state sovereignty can be explored through the U.S. Constitution's Tenth Amendment. The U.S. Supreme Court has had to interpret this text in numerous occasions, one of them being New York versus United States. In reaching its verdict and quoting one of the Federalist Papers, the court affirms the following, and I quote, States are not mere political subdivisions of the United States. State governments are neither regional offices nor administrative agencies of the federal government. The Constitution instead leaves to the several states a residuary and invaluable sovereignty. 
reserved explicitly to the states by the 10th Amendment. End of quote. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that be it a state within a federalized union or a state at an international level, sovereignty is the key. And Puerto Rico doesn't have that key. It doesn't have any sovereignty because it, it is neither a state nor an independent country. It cannot make the important decisions that any state would and should make because it lacks the most basic building block of any country or state. Sovereignty. So how do we fix this? How do we get Puerto Rico's sovereignty back? Quite simply, Puerto Rico would have to become a state or an independent country. Under statehood, it would have a voice and a vote in Congress and would have all the extent of sovereignty enjoyed by the 50 states today. As an independent country, again, Puerto Rico would regain its full sovereignty within the same degree as any other nation state. For that to happen, the first step is for the U.S. to renounce all claim of power or authority over Puerto Rico in favor of the people of Puerto Rico in regards to its ability to decide without any constraint whatsoever its political status and relationship with the U.S. After that, the next step would be for the people of Puerto Rico to be convened to a referendum with the objective of choosing the legal process through which the various options of status can be refined and elaborated in detail. In my view, the mechanism most adequate for undergoing such a task would be the Constitutional Status Assembly. Now, once the basic structure of the Assembly is established, including its purpose and limitations, the already mentioned referendum would take place, and that would allow the people of Puerto Rico to accept or reject the Constitutional Status Assembly as the method to be used to finally define Puerto Rico's status. If accepted, another electoral process would take place, this time with the objective of selecting a number of delegates, each one aligning him or herself with a specific status option. Once formed and each status option has proper representation, each one must be specifically defined and developed as fully as possible within a limited term. Put simply, the Constitutional Status Assembly's main task would be to articulate a definition of each status option with the representation of as many sectors of society as possible. After all, it's not enough to simply choose independence, for example. One must be aware of the repercussions of such a choice both economically and politically. This debate would eventually lead the Constitutional Status Assembly to choose a specific status option through a majority vote. Once a specific status option is defined and selected, the Constitutional Status Assembly would form a negotiation commission that would be responsible of initiating and concluding negotiations with the U.S. government. It's easy to suppose that such a negotiation would take quite some time to conclude and would require many modifications to the initial proposal. Both the relevant U.S. authorities and Puerto Rico's Constitutional Status Assembly would have to be consulted in order to approve or deny each proposed modification. This back and forth would continue until finally a conclusion and specific agreement would be formalized that would then be ratified by the people of Puerto Rico through another electoral process, finally solving the Puerto Rico issue. What I have just described is a very general overview of a very complex situation. By no means do I want to give off the impression that such a life-altering process wouldn't require extensive debate and regulation, along with the participation of numerous sectors. The role of the international community would also need to be defined. For example, Many people believe that the UN should supervise the process so as to secure further transparency, and actually I happen to be one of those people. In fact, the UN Special Committee on Decolonization drafted a resolution calling on the US government to provide a process that would allow Puerto Rico to exercise its right to self-determination. The resolution is titled Decision of the Special Committee of 20 June 2016 Concerning Puerto Rico. To read the full text of this resolution, please perform a Google search for the following term. Document A forward slash AC dot one zero nine forward slash two thousand seventeen forward slash l dot twelve before bringing this episode to a close i actually wanted to share with you some great news about puerto rico forward now you can find us on itunes on google play and patreon for more information head over to www.democracyatwork.info forward slash media hashtag p 
PR Forward. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. Y que viva Puerto Rico.